to the mini lecture on Gaussian beams. Now this is probably the most mathematical of all the readings we're going to have this semester and I'm going to do something a little bit unusual here. I'm going to go along and uh, talk over the derivation that's given in your book. It would be silly for me to do the derivation since the uh, it's pretty clear and the typing is much better than my writing would be. And if you're not interested in the derivation, if you're not interested in where all this comes from, I suggest you skip through until you see some slides that aren't out of your book. But you're going to want to have your book open for this, at least the first part of the presentation, where we derive where Gaussian beams come from and that are very important to the optical tweezer system you're going to build. So if you don't have your book with you, pause the presentation right now and go ahead and get it. Okay, uh, let's begin. And I'm just going to do sort of a, a, a narration over the action that's happening in the book here, and I expect you to follow along. So where do we start here? Uh, let's go ahead and grab our pen. We start off realizing that uh, a laser beam is pretty much like a plane wave. This is because the size of the laser beam in terms of wavelengths is very, very many wavelengths. Even a fairly small laser beam, something like a millimeter in diameter, has over a thousand wavelengths across from the visible region. And because the phase is changing very rapidly in the direction the beam is propagating on the order of two pi changes in one wavelength, we can essentially break the electric field out and say, look, um, we have a transverse component that's orthogonal to the direction of propagation, so our beams are going this way, and we've got some kind of, of amplitude variation that goes like this, but the wave is going really, really freaking fast along the z direction. And this change in phase along that way is much, much greater than the change in amplitude that goes transversely in the direction t out away from the beam. And again, in equation 3.2.2 and 3.2.3 and 3.2.4, he goes ahead and shows that and says, look, if, if, if this is, is you know, varying on the order of from the peak to the bottom in a couple of millimeters, uh, this variation from the peak to the peak is, is on the order of a micron, so it's a thousand times faster. Um, so what does that leave us? Uh, essentially what it says is that we can break our equation into two parts. Uh, essentially we have a plane wave, which as you know, and I'm down on equation 3.2.5 here, we have a plane wave which is E naught e to the minus jkz, our standard plane wave equation. And you'll see that that's essentially in here. But on top of this plane wave, we need to have a term that varies with uh, x, which is out of the board this way, and y, which is up that way. And says, you know, there's some variation of the amplitude with x and y, because this idea of a perfectly infinite plane wave that stretches to the ends of the universe is kind of silly. And so we're just going to add another component on here that says, look, this is how the field varies in x, y, and z. And we don't expect our laser beam to be exactly the same as it propagates. We kind of expect it to spread out a little bit. And so that's why the z component is in here. And that's what we're going to be deriving. Let's go on to page 65 now. Um, now he gets into some math. He says, OK, with this approximation, we can go back and we can solve the wave equation by plugging our transverse components and our z components right into here like this. So that expands out to there in 3.26. And, you know, we basically have our equation of the wave we derived before. You know, we know what k is. We're pretty familiar with that. And then he goes ahead and just does a lot of math. And you can do these derivatives if you want to. Um, but it falls essentially right straight out of there if you go ahead and do the derivatives as you learned in fields. And then you take all these derivatives, substitute them back into this equation, and you come up with this equation right here. So this is just uh, mathematical masturbation, just, just doing derivatives and moving things around. And essentially what he says, now this is kind of important, is he says that this has three equations, or three terms in it, equation 3.2.7. And if I look at this, um, I see that this term right here is much, much greater than this term right here because this is multiplied by this factor, k, and uh, since the wavelength is essentially 
on the order of less than a micron, K is going to be a factor of about a million or so or larger. But the variation of the laser beam, the shape of the laser beam as a function of Z, we don't expect to change very much because it's not a laser beam if it spreads out or changes really fast. And it's certainly the second derivative, which we expect to change slower than the first derivative, because that's the rate of change of the change, is going to be really tiny compared to this, this factor of a million that's in front of here. So we say that. Let's just get rid of that guy because it's so small. Um, is it an approximation? Absolutely. Is it valid in all cases? Absolutely not. But it makes the math a lot easier, so we're going to do it. So now we end up with a fairly simple equation that looks like this. And this is going to describe propagation of our laser beam. And remember, what we're trying to solve here is this term psi of x comma y comma z. And what this tells us is, is we have sort of this laser beam that's coming along, right? And we know it's spreading out a little bit as it travels in the z direction. This psi term tells us the field distribution, how the field changes as a function of position in space. And we expect psi to be, be fairly small um, on the order of millimeters, but that's sure a lot smaller or sure a lot larger than the change in phase of the beam. Okay. Go on to the next page. Now we're going to get into the real derivation here. This has just been setting up a differential equation and simplifying it so that we can solve it. And I'm going to warn you about this phase, is that the book sort of goes la da 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 Let's derive this thing, and isn't it obvious? Well, sure it's obvious uh, if somebody's already done it. But when people did it for the first time, it probably wasn't at all obvious. And you're seeing man hours or man months of effort to try to understand laser beams that was done at some point in the past. So, so don't think you're stupid or you can't understand just, just because the book sort of trips through in a couple pages, what took some really smart people months and months to figure out when they were first looking at it. Um, so where do we go from here? How do we analyze a laser beam, which is what we're interested in? Um, he sort of pops this thing out and says, we look for a solution that's cylindrically symmetric. Why? Because when you look at laser beams, they are cylindrically symmetric for the most part. And so whoever made the first couple of laser beams and tried to drive all of this said, gee, this is what we observe, so therefore we can do it. So we move the equation on the previous page, and let's go back here. So we're talking about this equation right here. We redefine that equation using the, the identities you can find in the back of your fields book into cylindrical coordinates, and that's all of this is. And now, as we always have when differential equations, you reach deep up inside you and pull out of your butt a uh, guess for what the solution is. And of course, when you read this in the textbook, the guess is never wrong the first time, the second time, or the third time. They always give you what the right guess is. Um, are you supposed to be able to do this on your own if you encounter something new? No. Um, but usually, most differential equations have been solved, and people have done all this guessing for you. And so right here, he tells you, this is what the solution is going to look like. Oy, oy, oy. Um, and essentially, this solution is going to look like an exponential. And it's a phase term because there's a j. And it has a component that varies with z through some unknown function. And a component that varies with r squared. And r squared is, of course, the equation for a circle. So we ex expect kind of a circular beam, which is where this comes from. And he goes through his mathematical manipulations here again to solve all of this and essentially comes up with equation 3.3.3, which is the solution he needs to solve. Um, and through more mathematical manipulation, what he comes up with is two equations he needs to solve for. Uh, the derivative of this q term that doesn't really have physical meaning yet, but hopefully we'll get to this, and the derivative of the p term, which is just defined in terms of the q term. So what does this mean? If we can solve these two very simple differential equations and do it in a way that provides some kind of physical meaning to the problem we're going to solve, which is figuring out the mathematical uh, description of a laser beam, which is actually very, very important to us. But if we can solve these two differential equations and not just do it mathematically but give some physical meaning, and then essentially what we have by substituting these solutions back into equation 3.3.2 here is we know the spatial distribution of the field of a laser beam. And that's what we're going for. 